Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, back to SpoilerCon. This is our special event. We are thrilled once again to welcome back Kate Redding and Michael Kramer, the voices in our heads, the audiobook narrators for the Wheel of Time series, and so many other books that are close to our hearts. Kate and Michael, welcome back to SpoilerCon. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So uh, the way we're going to uh, run this event today is we are going to have a special reading by Kate and Michael. Then we are gonna open it up to questions and answers. For those of you who are attending online, uh, we ask that you uh, put your questions into the SpoilerCon Discord server. We have a special channel called um, Ask Kramer Redding. Um, that's the channel I will be monitoring. So if you post the questions directly on YouTube, it is possible they will make their way to me, but if you wanna guarantee it, that's the place to post them. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, SpoilerCon is thrilled once again to sponsor Books to Prisoners as our charity of choice. All proceeds from SpoilerCon's uh, silent auction go to Books to Prisoners um, in honor of Kate and Michael, that is their charity. And uh, we are already have raised more than $2,000 this year. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, make sure you check out our silent auction. Um, even if you don't want to, if there's not an item that interests you, which I can't imagine, I do want to mention that Kate and Michael have kindly donated an audio recording. So if you want your voicemail message on your phone to be their voices in character, uh, that is still up for grabs. Um, but also we just accept flat out donations. So we do encourage you to um, donate uh, what you can to this really worthy charity. All of us have uh, known the love of books and to be able to provide them uh, to those who don't have free access to them, I think is a wonderful thing for all of us to come together and do. So uh, give generously once again, can. and please participate in the silent auction. With that, uh, I am thrilled to turn it over to Kate and Michael. Us. They are going to be reading a dialogue scene of Grendel and Samuel in A Crown of Swords. Kate and Michael, over to you. Inside a palace with stained glass windows and perfectly balanced temperature, on a deep dais with marble railings at one end, where lavish furniture commands a view of a long columned hall ten feet below. There are no stairs leading down because below is for displaying human entertainment. There are three pools set into the floor, each with fountains and performers. The floor is filled with people juggling, playing music, doing acrobatics, etc. Typical Grendel. Samael cautiously steps out of a gateway into Grendel's domain, looking around. Grendel comes up behind him, speaking before he sees her. Are my pets not beautiful? <laughs> These four are my favorites, I think. Ramsit is the Domani king's brother. The woman standing on his shoulders is Ramsid's wife. The other two are the king's youngest sister and eldest daughter. Don't you find it remarkable what can be learned with the proper encouragement? Consider all the talents going to waste. These two are my newest acquisitions from the lands beyond the Aeol Waste. They should thank me for rescuing them. Chiape was Shaboam, a sort of empress, newly widowed, and Shaofan was to marry her and become Shabotai. For seven years, she would have ruled absolutely, then died. Hereupon, he would have chosen a new Shaboam and ruled absolutely until his death in seven years. They have followed that cycle for nearly 3,000 years without a break. <laughs> Shaofan and Chiape insist the deaths are natural. The will of the pattern, they call it. To them, everything is the will of the pattern. Since so much of the demonic king's family met with our approval, I'm surprised no more did. I almost expect to see the king himself here serving wine. You know I choose only the most exquisite. Alsalam is not up to my standard. Sooner or later, you will slip, Grendel. One of your visitors will recognize one who serves him wine or turns down his bed and he will have the sense enough to hold his tongue until he leaves. What will you do if someone descends on this palace with an army to rescue a husband or a sister? An arrow may not be a shot lance, yet it can still kill you. <laughs> oh, Samael, why would I let them see anything but what I want them to? 
I certainly do not send my pets to serve them. Al Salam's supporters and his opponents, even the dragon sworn, leave here thinking I support them and only them, and they do not want to disturb an invalid. You would not believe how they all trust and listen to me. What do you have to tell me? About Luz Theron. You never seem interested in anything else. Now, he would be a pet. I would make him the centerpiece of every display. Not that he is handsome enough normally, but who he is makes up for that. And I do like them tall. Luz Theron is long dead. Randolph Thor is a jumped up farm boy, a choss hauler who has been lucky. Do you really think so? There has to be more than luck behind him. Luck could not have carried him so far, so fast. Have you learned where Althor is hiding Asmodian? Or anything of Lanfear's whereabouts? Or Morgedians? You know as much as I do. Myself, I think Luz Theron killed them. Oh, don't grimace at me. Althor, since you insist. There are rumors out of Kyrian about Lanfear dying at Luz Theron's hands the same day he killed Robin. Rumors. Lanfear has been aiding Althor since the beginning, if you ask me. I would have had his head in the Stone of Tear, except that someone sent Murdral and Trollocs to save him. That was Lanfear. I am certain. I'm done with her. The next time I see her, I'll kill her. And why would he kill Osmodian? Hmm? I would if I could find him. But he has gone over to Althor. He's teaching him. Always some excuse for your failures. Choose your own explanation if you wish. You may even be right. All I know is that Luz Theron seems to be removing us from the game one by one. So many of us have died confronting him. Agenor and Balthamel. Ishamel, Belal and Ravin, and Lanfear and Asmodian, whatever you believe. Possibly Mogedian. She might be creeping about in the shadows, waiting until the rest of us have fallen. She's foolish enough. I do hope you have somewhere prepared to run. There doesn't seem to be any doubt that he is going after you next. Soon, I would say. I'll face no armies here, but Luz Theron is gathering quite a large one to hurl against you. The price you pay if you must be seen to wield power as well as wield it. And if I destroy Althor, will it violate none of the great Lord's command? As far as you've told it to me, if you've held back. What Demondred told me that the great Lord told him, I have passed on to you somehow. Every word. I doubt even he would dare lie in the great Lord's name. But you've told me little enough of what he, of what he plans to do. Him, or Samarag, or Masana, practically nothing. I've told you what I know. For the rest, think back, Samael. We used to plot against one another almost as hard as we fought Luz Theron. Yet we were winning before he caught us all, gathered at Shailgu. Now we have awakened in a world where we should stand so far above ordinary mortals as to be another species, and we are dying. For a moment, forget who will be nameless. Althor, if you must call him by that name, Althor was as helpless as a babe when we woke. A Shamael did not find him so. We behave as if this is the world we knew when nothing is what we knew. We die one by one and Althor grows stronger. Lands and people gather behind him, and we die. Immortality is mine. I do not want to die. If he frightens you, then kill him. I serve the great lord and obey somehow. As do I, as well as any. So good of you to deign to kneel to our master. All I say is that Luz Theron is as dangerous now as he ever was in our own time. Frightened? Yes, I am frightened. I intend to live forever, not meet Robin's fate. Sir! Althor! Althor, Grendel! An ignorant boy, whatever Osmodian manages to teach him. 
A primitive lout who probably still believes that nine-tenths of what you and I take for granted is impossible. Elthor makes a few lords bow and thinks he has conquered a nation. He hasn't the will to close his fist and truly conquer them. Only the Aiel. But Jot de Roja. <laughs> who would have thought they could change so? Only they truly follow him, and not all of them. He hangs by a thread, and he will fall, one way or another. Will he? What if he is? She stopped. How many of us will die before it is done? We must stand together as we never have before. Then link with me. The pair of us linked would be more than a match for our Thor. Let that be the beginning of our new standing together. So, it seems we will go on as before. What more do you have to tell me? Little enough. Semirag missed the last gathering. I don't know why, and I do not think Masana or Demondred does either. Masana in particular was annoyed, though she tried to hide it. She thinks Luz Theron soon will be in our hands, but then she said the same every time. She was sure Belal would kill or capture him in the tear. She was very proud of that trap. Demondred warns you to be careful. So Demondred knows you and I meet? Of course he does. Not how much I tell you, but that I tell you something. I am trying to bring us together, Samael, before it is too... You deliver a message to Demondred from me. Tell him I know what he is up to. Tell him to be careful. I won't have him or his friends interfering in my plans. So long as they stay clear of me, his lackeys can carve out what he wants. But they will steer clear, or he will answer for it. You tell him. If you wish it. All these threats weary me. Come, listen to the music and calm yourself. There they are. Listen. Gesturing back at the Sharans. A peculiar place they come from. Women who can channel are required to marry the sons of women who can channel. And every one of those bloodlines is marked with tattoos on their faces at birth. No one with the markings is allowed to marry anyone without. Any child of such a union is killed. Tattooed males are killed in their 21st year in any case, and cloistered before, ignorant even of how to read. Do they bind themselves like criminals? No. The Ayad, as they call themselves, live in their own small towns, avoiding everyone else, and supposedly never channel without permission or orders from the Shabotai or Shabon. In fact, they are the real power, and the reason the Shabotai and Shaboan only rule seven years. <laughs> yes, a fascinating land. Too far from the center to be of any use for many years, of course. There will be plenty of time to see what can be made of it after the day of return. I'm sure their music is fascinating, but I have preparations to see to. Careful preparations, I trust. The great Lord will not be pleased if you disturb his plans. I have done everything short of surrendering to convince Althor I am no threat to him, but the man seems obsessed with me. You could abandon Ilion, start again elsewhere. No! You have told me all the great Lord's command. I dislike repeating myself, Samael. If you did not believe me the first time, you will not now. I see no reason to meet again until you have something to tell me besides whether Semerog was there or not. Next time, you can come to Ilion. If you are still there. Samael icily opens a gateway, slicing a servant in half. If you want to help us stay alive and find out how Demandred and the others mean to carry out the Great Lord's instructions, Oh, excuse me. If you want to help us stay alive, find out how Demon Dread and the others mean to carry out the Great Lord's instructions. Grendel is annoyed at the loss of a servant as Samael steps through the gateway.
Thank you so much. One of the reasons we love uh, doing this at SpoilerCon is just the ability to ask you to read things that you didn't actually get to read in the series. Uh, so it's it's a great treat for us. So thank you. Um, and to see you acting it out as well. Um, what, a, what a pleasure for us. Um, what we are going to do is for those of you who are here in person, if you have a uh, question for uh, Kate and Michael, you can go ahead and line up uh, there or you can pass it to Aradia who will pass them up to me. Um, all right, let's start with a question. Oh, oh okay. we're going to get untangled. Uh, let's start with a question that uh, came to us uh, via Twitter from the master of the deck. Your son Henry has recently started his career in voiceover and narration. What would you say is the most different thing about starting that career now from when the two of you began and what's still the same? I mean, what's still the same is you're telling stories. Everything else is completely different. The, the, the platforms that are available, the amount of self-publishing, the, the geyser of content. I think I'm right in saying when we started, everything was, there were gatekeepers and those were the publishers. And if your book wasn't published, there was no way you were getting an audio book. Right. They, the technology has basically really changed the industry in that um, before it used to take at least two people working together to create the book, uh, the audio book, because the machinery wouldn't operate. We were working with reel to reels and, and um, ADAT and uh, DAP machines that you couldn't operate as a individual narrators so you had to have an engineer that's and then and then there was a long process everything happened by snail mail or your 100 watts line um 800 watts line in terms of ordering you had duplication and you know it's like imagine if there was only say 100 copies of rhythm of war when it was released or a memory of light when it was released and so you'd write in and say, I would like to have a, you know, listen to that. And it'd be like, well, when we get a copy back in, we'll send one out <laughs> back to you. And people would have a, a copy for three, four weeks, whatever they might, they might get it back at that point, or they might renew their subscription, so to speak. So all of those um, choke points in the production have been removed. Typically, as Kate said, um, the book was in print for usually three to six months, if not years before it was actually made into an audio book. And I can remember getting shipped to me 25 books and they would just say, okay, um, we would like this one first, but then the rest of them, as you can get to them, because there was no pressure to release them with the print copies because the print copies have been out for in some cases years. And now it's, the book is being released Tuesday um, and you have, uh, you know, X amount of time to get it done so that they can have it ready so that when the print copy hits, the audio, the uh, audio book is ready to download that same day. Oh. So. What kind of advice would you give Henry or any other new narrator on how to deal uh, with voicing a character that you just don't like? Oh, they're the most fun. <laughs> They're, they're the most fun um, because if you don't like them, it's because <clears throat> you think they're really different from you and they're inferior to you or you're better than them. And so they're distanced from you. So it's actually really easy to voice a character you don't like because you can just be the mean, nasty, ugly person you refuse to admit you are and put that into the character voice. It's really fun. The, the, harder, <laughs> the harder thing to do is material that you don't like. Oh yeah, that's a different thing. Uh, and that's a different animal. Uh, and that- um, Gut it out. Well, there's, there's <laughs> the gutting out, but, but there's also the, your, your job is to tell the story. Yeah. So, um, and you have to find a way to, uh, it might be an exaggeration, love that character. Um, you have to find a way to love that material even if it's not material that you stand behind 100%. Um, 
So that's that's the trick of you know of any job to a certain degree, doing the thing that you find hard to embrace. And that's where like the whole your whole purpose really is to serve. So you're a servant <laughs> and you've got to do the bidding of the book. Very appropriate for the wheel of time. <laughs> um, have you ever said no to a project because you didn't like the source material? Yep. Yes. Can you, obviously we won't want you to say what project, but what could you give us a, a sense of like what kinds of things really would make you say no? For me, um, there's, uh, there was, uh, there was a book that I did early on in my career and it was, it was, um, from a, it was from a very religious perspective. So it was, it was kind of, it was biased, um, it was pretty out there in terms of declaring that this was the right way. <clears throat> and it just made me very uncomfortable because I really deeply, deeply disagreed. And um, I just asked the publisher not, not to send me any of those. Um, and it was like, fine, yeah, totally understood. Um, some people don't mind doing that material at all. Um, and I just, for me, it was just like, I could not, I couldn't get over how false I, my voice felt. And the other one, which <clears throat> has been a more recent development is, uh, I really, really would prefer not to do books where women are victimized, like where that's the whole point of the book. Um, I can understand a, a, you know, a momentary victimization if it's to move the plot along, you know, if it's, if it's part of the story, but when it is the whole story, um, then again, I'm just like, I just, it makes me too angry. I can't, I just can't. Yeah, uh, uh, part of it is, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've done, so I, I, uh, part of it is a question of the, of the quality of the writing. Um, so when, when it's really questionable, that means a couple of different things. One, it's going to slow me down. Uh, because if you can't trust the, the, the sentence structure, if you're constantly questioning, is that the right word? Is that is there agreement between subject and verb? Are, are we in the same tense? You you can't relax into the story because you're constantly, it's like, imagine driving a car where you're constantly checking all the filters and everything. It's like, by the time you've moved two feet, you have to check everything again. Um, so that's one thing that has kind of caused me to back away. Um, and then there's also sometimes, especially for me, um, I sometimes wonder, you know, it's like you're not every voice is, is best suited for certain material. Um, so that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to serve the material. And if you feel like it's, it's a bit like this really needs a piccolo and I'm a cello, um, I can do it. I can play that melody for you, but, um, it, it really needs a different uh, timbre. It's going to be more effective, um, and that's ultimately going to make the the story better for the audience um, and for the author, for that matter. Because then it's going to be better realized. Do you have a lot of direct conversations with authors? And if so, what's the weirdest conversation you've ever had with an author? <laughs> <laughs> So when we work with publishing companies, there's a firewall. You're not really supposed to contact the author. They like everything to go through them so that they have control of the process. We now, um, we have a hire us page on our website and people actually have been filling out the form and hiring us to record their books. So it's been quite wonderful because we have had direct communication with a ton of authors over the last year and a half or so. And um, there are there are many weird conversations. Um, I, don't, 
most of them you know, we're yeah. we're weirds i don't know that we're like yeah like qualified to judge something as weird um but some of the stories are weird like Oh, well, there's, yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there's just, um, part of what's happening now um, is people are, ex authors are expanding the genres, like lit RPG didn't exist, um, you know, 25 years ago, I mean, as a, as a, so how, how do you approach that, that that's, you know, what, how does that story function? It, and so that you get in, into those uh, most of the time it's it's fairly rewarding um in terms of the interaction because uh you can get ideas oh that's how i want to take that character or or not um sometimes most of the most of the discussions though are kind of banal things it's like there's a typo on this page what what do you mean well, what did you mean here um uh or um I, i'm you know it's i think you know we need to fix something here and that's just it's house cleaning it's like oh right so we want white sheets on this bed not pink sheets you know that type of thing so it's not anything major um i i would say the conversations with authors absolutely run the gamut mm -hmm. and and the it took like we're developing these relationships with these authors. So some of them are very funny. Um, and you, yeah, they're all unique and their stories are all unique. Mm -hmm. And so you never know what the conversation is gonna be, but it's fun. Mm -hmm. uh, someone else would like to know, what are your favorite character voices from the Wheel of Time to perform? Um, I, that's, you know, Loyal was always fun. Um, uh, Matt became fun. It was hard to find Matt at first uh, because his character developed. Um, but I don't know that there's, uh, they're just fun scenes to do because the story was being told so well. It's like, oh, this is a fun scene to do. Um, so the, the, when the characters are clearly drawn in the writing, then it, it doesn't matter what voice you're doing. It's like, you feel like I'm slipping my hand into the glove um, and it fits so well. Um, that feeling is, is, is a thrill. Uh, and that can happen with, you know, a straight up, you know, nothing, nothing particularly different about that voice or it can be, you know, Loyal was a challenge just because the, you know, the the voice, I think there was like a two par paragraph description of the voice before you even had it. So it's like, and then it's a three page monologue that he has in that first, you know, uh, the first book. I think uh, I loved the way the women uh, developed over the series. And I loved those moments when um the the more regal the more strong the more powerful the more sort of important women they would have little slips they would show their humanity those moments were great because you have this voice for this woman who's giving battle speeches and weaving spells and condemning people to death and doing all kinds of big things and then you know, she stubs her toe and she's like, oh, bother. And that's always <laughs> really fun when you have like that incongruity. But some of the, um, I'm not going to say lesser because there are no lesser characters in the Wheel of Time, but some of the characters who had less playtime, let's say, um, for example, like Varen and Swan were like definitely favorites because they were so clear. One was books, one was fish. You know, you knew exactly where you were and they really were single minded. They had lots of foibles because they were like they were kind of one track mind people. And so those two stand out as yes, they, they were a lot of fun to do. But mm -hmm. I liked I liked all. Of them. Yeah. Pardon fame too, in that regard.
because that was just such a different writing style. Um, you know, that when you encounter a chapter with him, it was just, we were not in Oz anymore, or we're not in Kansas anymore, I should say. Um, it was interesting that you mentioned Varen there, Kate, because in the podcast, uh, as we commonly say, Varen knows. She yeah. knows exactly. everything, yeah. right? So we always say that Varen knows. In fact, yeah. our uh, lanyards that I'm not wearing mine, uh, Seth, if you won't mind, I'll just show you. Uh, <coughs> our lanyards for the con, in fact, say Varen knows. Yeah. So we're big That's fans good. as well. And if she doesn't know, she knows where to go to find the information so that she does know. <laughs> She's a true academic yeah. Uh, yeah. in that sense, yes. Um, Michael, you, you, know, you said that you think more in terms of favorite scenes instead of favorite characters to voice. So would you share a favorite scene or two from The Wheel of Time that you really enjoyed? Uh, um, I think... Um, when uh, Perrin is, is rescuing uh, Bail, um, and and the, and goes back to the two rivers, that 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 whole section, those sections of that that book in particular, just had a a, a drive of their own. Um, the the Perrin Fail scenes. Um, were were always very interesting, and then there was and and Matt was when Matt was trying to put on the play, and he's writing the play um, as a theater artist. Um, the frustration that you when the actors are are you know asking reasonable questions, but but they but they really you know they don't have the grasp of the material the way you know you do as an actor, it, uh, you know the playwright you know Matt the playwright that was a, a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, those, that would, those are just two, I, you know, again, when, when it, the, the piece has that momentum, you, you just, it, it's like skiing downhill. You just run with it, um, and go. Kate, how about you? Oh God. <laughs> it doesn't have to be the favorite, just. I know, but there are just so many. <laughs> I always liked when the Murdrals came because and I got to voice the Murdrals because to me there was something about um it's like the monster under the bed, right? Like like something that we're all scared of. It's this nameless, formless, shapeless, weird thing. And then boom, there they are. And to to be able to sort of embody the terror that people feel in that moment. I also really liked some of the really cruel scenes. Um, there's there was one there was one particular it was like horrible. Um, And then, so I liked Avienda because she was just so gutsy. She didn't like, she was practical and she just kept moving forward. And so those scenes where she's like, she might be knocked down, but she's getting up again and she keeps going. Um, that's like the opposite of the scenes with the Murdrals, because that's an example for everybody in their life about like, yeah, well, and tomorrow's another day and you just keep going, you know? Yeah. There's also the scene where Rand and his father at the, at the mm -hmm. very end, the kind of push to understand it's not going to be life is not going to be perfect. Um, that doesn't that should not stop you. Mm -hmm. um, and and you don't have to beat yourself up because you're not perfect. Um, Step in from Twitter asks, what were your favorite aspects of Robert Jordan's and Brandon Sanderson's writing? 
um, you spoke about the need to have good writing and uh, we assume that they pass the test. So uh, are there certain aspects of their writing that you found particularly appealing or um, that kind of made your job easier? I think something you mentioned about, you know, when you, when you get that momentum going, uh, I think they both did that really, really well. Um, and it feels like a Shakespearean um, battle scene in a way, um, because you get this piling on of um, events and people talking and events and people talking and everything is moving forward, 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 forward. And you really do just coast. You just go with it. Um, and I think both of them did that. Both of them did that really well. And I think Brandon's women got more interesting over time. So that was really cool. Because at first, it was like they weren't allowed to be funny. And then over the course of the series, I was like, oh, she's funny. She's getting funnier. This is fun. She can be funny. She can be, you know, like Shalom. She can be messed up. She can be confused. She can also be really funny. And that was, that was a lovely discovery to watch that sort of develop. Yeah, I think for me, a lot of it has to do with, with the, the themes of redemption. Um, I mean, I think, um, you know, coming of age and uh, dealing with these really huge, it's what's interesting is, you know, in 2021, who would have thought that, you know, th that there's this big, powerful thing outside? They've been calling it dragons and the dark force and whatever for 20, 30, 40, 70, 80, 90 years. Well, we see it as COVID or climate change or uh, racial injustice. Um, You can you can call it whatever you want. The battle is the same. Um, and then and then as I, I think was the last time just talking about how it was such an interesting choice story wise to corrupt the male power. Because I think a lot of men deal with with anger and strength and or the lack thereof in it's hard to the society isn't helping us um giving us a lot of tools to access or chances to play with it. it's forbidden kind of like um male channeling is forbidden um and how it can be it can be incredibly powerful and it can be incredibly destructive um, and so to see that played out over uh, a 16 book series and the journey that both the, the books, but the characters take in terms of coming to grips with who and what they are and both the, the, the positive side and the dark side of whatever abilities they have, whether it's Perrin and his, um, you know, the, this destructiveness that he has, but he needs to where he where he finds salvation is in creation. So, which is a, you know the the opposite. So the, the and I I think uh, and and this is partly with with Brandon especially, and but even with Robert Jordan, um, Brandon can be very very funny, and I really appreciate that, especially when you know, you're 20 hours into a book and it's like, it can't all be big battles. It has to be, you know, slapstick. Um, uh, it just gives you, it may, it, it allows you to go to choose anything. So, yeah. 
Um, speaking of Brandon Sanderson and Shalon, there's a question about pattern, um, specifically patterns voice. Tanya Crossman on Twitter asks, uh, how did you come up with the voice for pattern in Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive? And do you kind of agree on the voice together before you do it in case both of you have to voice the same character or do you kind of each do your own take on it? I think in that case, I had pattern First. Oh, you had pattern. I, I didn't have pattern for for uh, a long time. And and that was just a question of the the description. So you know, pattern is introduced as like a buzzing noise, and so I just tried to buzz while I spoke, <laughs> and then it started to feel really great, and it felt like a character. It felt like someone with an attitude. Um, and so that was, yeah, that was his voice. <laughs> and then I kept telling my, you're not doing it right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the challenge when, when in, in the dual narration, because in dual narration, you're constantly doing the other person's characters. Um, and especially because we have very different instruments, vocal instruments is to kind of distill the essence of the character. So very much like I was talking about musically before, it's like, uh, how can how can my cello um, imitate the, you know, capture the essence of that character when it's initially voiced by a flute? Um, um, and that's what you're, that's what we're, we go for. And so a lot of times our, our our discussions when we talk about character voices are more of what's the essence of the character. Um, knowing that, okay, um, yeah, they're not going to sound, they can't sound the, exactly the same. And that's not the goal. The goal is to capture the essence. Um, and then so that that part of the story can continue forward. Uh, we have a question from Sherbert Mango on Discord about how to pronounce ca some characters' names. Um, they're particularly interested in uh, your position on the pronunciation, and I'm not going to bias you, I'm going to say, on the character we know as uh, the King of Malkir. Uh, apparently, there's uh, some conflict over how to pronounce. Wait, which character? Name. The King of Malkir, L-A-N. Um Man. What's what's the land land? Okay, so yeah. there is no okay. So you guys agree? Apparently, there's a there's a, apparently some controversy over it's lawn or land. No, it's land. I mean, okay, um, definitive. The, the the tricky thing with some of the pronunciations, what happened was, you have to understand the books were, we received the first five books to do, like in the, in that box, and um, there's a glossary at the back. Um, but the glossary has about one tenth, if that, of the names. And especially with the Forsaken, they weren't called the Forsaken in the writing until later. So when you would come across uh, some of the Forsaken in those first couple of books, you didn't know that, oh, because I, I went back to the glossary and I looked, oh, uh, it's not here under, you know, Landfear, not there. Um, okay, so I get to do whatever. Uh, and then you, then ultimately you find out, oh, she's one of the Forsaken. Oh, there's, look, there's a, there's a little paragraph on pronunciations. Um, and that's where the, the Forsaken are listed. Um, a side note we came across an interview with Robert Jordan. Um, and even though he wrote the glossary, the way he pronounced some of the names were different than they are in the glossary, yeah. which is what he, so, <laughs> and this fluid. is, <laughs> it, it, it is fluid. Um, I think the, the one that really tripped us up was Mogedian because, um, um, very early on, um, what with regard to pronunciations um we started the books when there was no internet when there was no f free long distance um basically you either wrote a letter or you paid for a very expensive phone call 
Um, there were no uh, word processors. Um, so you had to type it out by hand and then you'd have to photocopy it if you wanted to do anything more than that. So early on, about I want to say probably four hours into that first Eye of the World um, book, um, and I'm I've long since exhausted the glossary in terms of the character names. We were I was panicking, going, uh, "What do we do? Because how are we going to get this to write? You know, to to send him a list and then have him say this is how it's pronounced or that how it's pronounced." The one time we talked uh, directly. Uh, with Robert Jordan was that we basically, he said, um, you basically have, car I mean, we took the kind of phonetic rules that you kind of were somewhat evident from the glossary and said, well, when we come across a new name, we'll kind of use those rules to give that pronunciation and he said that's fine and he never ever got, <clears throat> came back to us and said this is wrong so i think the question is actually more about the mistakes <clears throat> i think the question is <clears throat> that we can never seem to shake is why do each of us why do we say a name differently not in agreement so why did i say mogadin instead of Mogedian. Bad communication, we failed to communicate. I recorded my part of the book. I used one pronunciation. I assumed he was using the same, he wasn't. Nobody caught it in quality control. The audiobook was published. Mistakes happen and it annoys me that people hang on this issue because you can say that name however you want. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's up to the reader or the listener or whatever, the artist. If you're painting a painting and you want to title it, you can pronounce that name however you want. So I do wish people would just drop it. <laughs> well, and the other, the other thing in terms of language, um, when I was going to grade school, the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Now it's dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, language changes. Um, I know of one baseball player who was Chavez, then he was uh, Chavez, then he was Chavez. Um, and that's, his, that's him changing the way he wants his name pronounced. Um, so language is a bit fluid. Uh, I, I, there's a story I work for the, we both worked for the Library of Congress talking books program and um, a very wonderful narrator, Ray Hagen was doing Isaac Beshevitz singers um, books that have been done in translation. Nobel prize winning stuff, tons of Polish, Polish names. And he called up the author and said, how do I pronounce these? And this is a Nobel Prize winning author. And he's like, well, this is how I say it. But really, just don't worry about the pronunciations of the names. Tell the story. And that has kind of been the mantra of, of the, both the library and, and our work. Um, you're serving the story. You're trying to make the story clear. You're trying to, you know, you're trying to invite your imagination as a as a reader to engage with this work and explore it in terms of what it means to you um and it, it, to a certain degree get lost in it um and to the degree that we can be that we can disappear that's great <laughs> because it, it's that's that's the goal you said, uh, I remember last year in our conversation, you said something that always stuck with me about how the sort of different layers of interpretation um, between reading a book for yourself, 
listening to it on an audio book and then seeing it as a television show or a movie and that it's sort of adding on layers of interpretation. And I always really like, I think in what you just said about pronunciation of characters, thinking it in those terms is helpful, right? This idea of it's a layer of interpretation, just as you might not like a um, televised version of a particular book that you loved or a movie version, um, you might not like that aspect of the books. That's, pro that's not a problem, you know, you can have it. But um, I'm, I'm certainly, uh, as somebody who butchered uh, many pronunciations last night during our trivia competition, I'm <laughs> pleased to know that all of my butchered pronunciations are absolutely correct because they're mine. <laughs> um, do we have any questions from the audience that are here uh, or, or comments? If you'd like to, um, uh, Seth is walking around with the microphone. Well, not all, but I have all right, you have to walk up to Seth with the microphone. <laughs> um, I just was wondering what, um, what do you do for voice care as your, uh, are you able to hear me? What do you do for voice care as you're, you know, I don't, it sounds like you read a lot of books. Do you, do you, what do you do to take care of your voice? Not what I did last night. <laughs> <laughs> no, what was the, I, I didn't quite hear the question. What do you do for voice care? So, so oh. you do not hang out by a fire drinking gin and tonic until two in the morning. That is not good. <sighs> Um, I, 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 I will tell you that sleep is the most important thing you can do for your voice. So getting eight hours of sleep is, is primary. Um, it, it really depends on your physical makeup. I can drink coffee. A lot of people can't touch caffeine or can't touch the acid in coffee. Uh, I recently just finished a 40 hour book where I was doing a whole bunch of work and I would have one cup of coffee and then switch to apple, hot apple cider, which for me cleared my vocal mechanism. But, but really the most important thing is sleep um, because that aids, usually what gives out before your voice is your concentration. Um, and uh, uh, if you're tired, it will come through because all of a sudden your brain is saying, Oh, I have to conserve. I have to conserve. I'm not going to be exploring the text in the same way you would if you have tons of energy, but then, yeah, also don't sit outside drinking gin and tonics by a campfire <laughs> in the cold air. That's also. I, I was going to literally ask what uh, cocktails you were drinking uh, yeah. these days. Gin and tonic yeah. last night. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would say sleep, water, and um, aerobic exercise, because the voice is the last part of breathing, right? So if your breathing is not vigorous, your voice is going to feel weak. Yeah, I find that the, the, when I get into stretches, it's like all, all of a sudden my endurance, my vocal endurance gets stretched. Um, I can go through a whole paragraph without having to take a breath. So. Next question, and, and please give your name before asking. Uh, hey, so my name is Travis. I've been... Just have to speak a little louder. Wait, and for the question, you think, take your mask off. That would be... There you go. Cool. Is this better? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> cool. My name is Travis. I've been a long time listener to your guys' books. Um, I really liked what you guys did opening this this panel with Grandal and Samael. Have you guys ever considered narrating an audiobook in that fashion? Duet. Yeah. That's a that's it's a duet. That that's a new um that's a new a new uh, fangled thing. A new kind of um production uh process. There are two different there I'm gonna there's straight duet, which is what we just did. Um, and the, what has to happen that that script has to be laid out very clearly in terms of which one of us would take the narrative. Um, cost wise, it's double, um, 
because uh, you're paying two people to work and accomplishing one half of what would normally happen in that time. So the so there may be ways that that um, could happen, but for the most part, it's not a decision that we're making so much as uh, the engineering that has to happen and the cost to produce the, the book uh, would escalate. Now, uh, I know that it's happening more. In fact, the, the next thing that I'm doing is kind of a combination. Uh, it's a what I call a dual duet hybrid where I'm voicing all the male characters and I have certain chapters where I have the narrative and there's another narrator who's doing all the female characters and she has chapters where she's doing the narrative. But we're not in the same, we're not like this going back and forth. Um, we're going to approximate that to the degree that uh, I'm not going to be hearing her doing doing the line when I encounter it in the text, and so it's going to be well. How do I respond to that? Um, but it's it's mostly a question of engineering wise setting up a situation where we can be in the same space, and then the producer being willing to pay double, uh, and probably having to pay an engineer a whole lot more to put it all together. Anyone else in the audience? Yeah, come on up. Uh, how you doing? My name is Danny. And uh, my question is just, would you rather have lived through the last battle in Ramland or the last desolation on Roshar? Say, say that one more time. Uh, would you rather live through the last battle in Ramland or the last desolation on Roshar? What was the last uh, desolation the, of Roshar? I, I'm not, Can you give us right. a brief description the, of both they of mean, oh. So he asked about, would you rather live through the last battle oh. in the Wheel of Time or the last desolation from the Stormlight Archive? Uh, Got it. You take it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what Brandon does in the last escalation for Roshar. Uh, um, partly because there's another generation coming up after this next escalation, which is kind of normal. Um, I don't. My big question is, who would I be? Like, would I have to be myself? Like, pink, squishy human? Like, definitely gonna get flattened? Or could I be like, could I be something else? Because if uh, I could be like. You can be naive, is what they said. Uh, okay, <laughs> then definitely last battle. <laughs> no, I um, it, Yeah, yeah there's. The, the, which scares you more? Huh? Which scares you more? Well, this is again. This is these are the themes that um, to me that this the that the fantasy is addressing, and they're very they're huge. And and yeah. I think the last two years, especially, have made us um, more aware that we're actually fighting the last battle, or we're we're in we're in a different situation. We it, it's it's fantasy is closer to reality than we actually think. Um, with regard to that. Um, so in that regard, uh, you got to pick. Yeah, you got to pick. Yeah, well, I'm I, I'm Rochard. Okay. Um, 
we have a technical question from uh, Malkier uh, Digitally, which uh, is one, uh, one of our um, planning committee members. Um, uh, given that you mentioned the engineering necessary to do uh, duets, he asks, he says, I know that you both record in separate spaces as you use different mics. How important is the mic in regards to recording an audiobook? The microphone. Oh, I think it is pretty, pretty important. Um, you know, a really good mic can make you sound amazing. And a really bad mic is gonna do the opposite. I think engine, yeah, you can you can come up with them with the machinery to help you out, but certain microphones are going we have different we use different mic we use Neumann mics. We have different mic microphones. Um they are lightly EQ'd differently. Um, but that's, uh, again, a good microphone is going to fit your voice like the, like the glove. Yeah. Um, whereas the bad microphone, it's going to make a... You're always going to be fighting. You're going to be, yeah. And or you, it won't have the warmth that it will miss something that's quintessential to your voice. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's what you're trying to, I mean, it... it Put it this way a bad microphone is kind of like listening to an orchestra and you know the violins can't hear the violins well that's might be really important or you know the timpani gone can't hear it the fireworks in the 1812 overture not hearing them um you know and you want that um for a, a good mic you, it's worth it it's definitely yeah. worth it. It's definitely worth it. And but the other thing is, um, again, you asked at the beginning, you know, how is it different now for Henry and, and his generation who's starting out now? There's so many more options. The tech is so developed. There there are like microphones for under seven hundred dollars that actually, if they suit your voice, are amazing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go out and spend, you know, fifteen hundred, three thousand right. dollars, whatever. And that's the other thing is, it's not just a question of the brand. You know, like, there's the engineering of the mic, and some of them are like Cadillacs, and they're really like fancy, and they're beautifully made. But uh, <clears throat> some microphones suit your voice, and some don't. And, it, you know, if you find the brand and the model that suits you, don't worry too much about the ticket price. Any other questions from the audience? Hello, my name is Neil. Um, you narrate some series like The Wheel of Time that are long and complex and really draw you in. Um, and as readers, we all speculate a huge amount at the end of those series about what happens afterwards. Um, do you get so captivated that you also speculate um, about the fate of uh, Randland and Roshar afterwards. Um, and do you ever get sufficiently tempted to try writing any stories yourself, given that you have such a creative background in theater? I, I um, this is going to sound horribly disappointing, maybe. Um, I feel like I lack the imagination. I see what readers bring when they turn their attention on the series <clears throat> and they examine the characters and they analyze the events and then they speculate about what happens afterwards. I don't have that kind of imagination. I'm an interpreter. You guys are more like creators, like you, take this stuff and you really dig in and you focus on it. And for me, it's like, I'm serving that series and then it's done and I'm on to the next project. So I don't actually have the bandwidth and the brain space to indulge in that kind of examination. Anyone who, who's, a, who's a fan of The Wheel of Time, who's read it more than once, probably knows it better than I do, I feel. So I feel like, you know, not worthy, not worthy. You guys are the experts. Um, even though I like voiced it, it's, 
it's less of a complicated relationship, a deep relationship. It's more immediate, present, and then it's done. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, uh, part of it is just the, the, just the necessary, I have to move on to the next project and I've got 20 different worlds going. Um, there, there are some times when you're like, oh, this is over. Oh, there's more to this story. Why did they? What? No, no, come on. Um, there's more here. Um, I can I feel that, but that's partly the writing. Um, I don't have the uh, the luxury, I would say, of the time to spend on that. Um, just because you know, like last week, I'm in the middle of uh, another series where I've got a world that um, is in here. And then I'm going to take that out, put it on the shelf. Don't throw it away because I'm going to come back to it, in, <laughs> you know, in one year, in two years, in six months, in, in this case, five years. Um, and I have to remember all of that. Um, and that's what that's that's the, that's the challenge for us, I think, too, is just keeping those characters alive uh, and that world alive and realize, oh, right. OK, so like in Mistborn, for instance, going, we're going, you know, we're in generation two, but this line actually resonates back to book one of generation one, you know, <laughs> which was 13 years ago. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> so. Other questions from the audience? Hello. Oh, hi. Math. Okay. Hi, my name Hi. is Avery. Uh, so, have you guys uh, seen the trailer for the show? <laughs> I have. I have not. What do you think? Oh, oh, okay. What no. do you think? Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we do too. Yeah. How could you like, not? Like the amazing locale, like the, the oh. landscape, and then those people. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I was going to ask you in particular uh, what you thought of Rosamond's voice for Maureen. It's great. It's yeah. her voice. like she's doing her iteration of Maureen. I think it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, we're all very excited. <laughs> yeah, can we make you watch it now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can do like a reaction thing. Can we do that? Yes, yes. How do we do that? Rob, can we make this happen? Rob, bring your skills to the table. There we go. Folks. Okay, great. <laughs> no, uh, do you know it's like it's a social media phenomenon. Do you understand what okay, this is? Yeah. Reaction shots. Uh, well, I'll, it will be what it'll be a reaction I mean, shot. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's it's when you film people. Yeah. Who are no, I choose. I've seen that. Yeah, like okay. the first time you heard this song. Yeah. Exactly. Oh my god. Right. Like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go, Rob. Right. We are going to be doing a reaction shot of Michael's first time seeing the trailer. Okay, can you see that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm not sure that they're gonna see it on the I need to make sure they can see it on on the we YouTube. We can see it here. I need to make sure they can see it on YouTube because I'm capturing my displays. So okay, can you still see it? No. no. Now we're seeing the YouTube we're seeing you. layout. Okay, right. Let me stop and then I shall reshare and I'll do it that way. <laughs> this is so much fun. <laughs> okay. And can you make that screen really big for us? I will do my best. Might need to put Rob, I owe you like ten beers after this. <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> this, I, this is. Uh, I was not expecting this, but I can. Sorry, sure I can make this work. Have no fear. It's worth it. All right. Um, we can also uh, um, draw your attention to earlier today. We did a uh, divorce court proceeding for Egwene and Gawain. 
uh, for SpoilerCon. And so I'll send you the link so you can enjoy that as well. <laughs> That's hilarious. <clears throat> okay. okay, can you see that now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, let me try and make. Okay. Let's see if I maximize. Yes. There we go. How's that? You can see that pretty well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me just adjust that for the folks at home who are watching digitally. Okay. Well, I think we're ready. Be strong. The wheel of time turns us, leaving memories that become legend. The power inside you. All over the world, there are different names for it. But it's one thing. One power. And women who can touch it. We protect the world. No matter what happens, We face a heartbreak. The wheel keeps turning. The Dark One is coming for your friends. The last battle is coming. The only thing that matters is what you do. Whatever happens now, there's no turning back. That's a, that, that I think um, the trailer, especially right now, brings up another point, which is the the strength of making men and women equal in the power structure, in the in in who they are. This is not damsel in distress. This the, the women are as strong as men if not stronger to a certain degree. Um, and that is ahead of its time, uh, considering when it was written. Uh, so it'll be, I mean, it, got, it looks like they'd have a fan, fan, fantastic cast, um, you know, with what they're doing, you know, with what Marvel is doing in terms of uh, diversity, um, I think I think that's going to be really powerful, um, and they, you know, they've only got what six hundred hours of material <laughs> to work with. So, um, yeah, uh, that that's the one thing I think I think people are going to it's going to send people to the books, but just like everything else, there's so much more in the books because the novel can take its time, whereas uh, television or, or film or whatever you want to call it, uh, will have to condense it down because I don't think they're going to want to take 30 years to finish it. <laughs> so. that, that one of the fascinating things about the difference between film and audio books or print books is with film, you have, you have the text, you have what people are saying. That is a tiny, tiny, tiny portion. Your senses are being assaulted by this huge visual landscape and 
music. Yeah. You've got the music, which is calibrating your emotions the entire way, all the way through. The music is telling you, oh, this is tender. And then the music is telling you, oh, we're going to go kill some people. And then the text, like what the actors actually say is like minimal, minimal. It's maybe like 5% of the whole experience. Yeah, different, different it's medium. so amazing yeah. because music is so powerful. If you could put scent into the screen <laughs> and like puff out yeah. scent, right. you know, that would be even more Surround elemental. Scent. <laughs> Surround <laughs> scent. I'm going to pass on scenting the Trollocs, but yeah, uh, yeah no, I, but I, I agree. It would be an experience. Uh, other questions from the audience? Hearing would be a different experience. Hello, uh, I'm Super Chicken. And why is that funny? Um, uh, so first of all, thank you for doing this every year. Uh, I feel like I want to just share to you with you and like talk about the world because I really enjoy your perspectives, your deep, thoughtful perspectives and your humor. Um, and which reminds me, so I was going to ask like, do you, before your answer to the last question, before the re reaction video, I was going to say, do you have theories about Nokomi and who she is? But given uh, your answer to that, Kate, I don't want to ask that question anymore. And instead, I want to ask, do you know any jokes? And I'm willing to trade you a joke, but like, I just want to hang out with you guys. And I want to, I want to, I want to exchange jokes. So here's my joke. Um, and I'm sorry for those of you to whom I've already told this joke. Um, what do you get? when you cross an elephant and a rhino. Elephant and a rhino? Yeah. I don't know. Elephino. What do you get when you cross an elephant and a rhino? Elephino. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to know if you if you guys have any jokes to share. Oh, God. jokes. Thank you. No, we no. can't tell a joke. No. <laughs> I need a it's going to be a bad, no. Yeah. It's going to be. <laughs> wrong yeah yeah okay <laughs> well well let's see if you can think of one anyone else from the audience yes come on up i actually don't have to bend down um i'm grace and it was more along lines of you're talking about putting the stuff on a shelf and then coming back to it do you ever have to go back and listen to yourselves like go back and listen to the old ones and then when you do listen to yourselves, do you ever just go, oh, oh, oh no. <laughs> I wish I'd done that another way. So uh, listening to voice clips of the character voices, uh, I just finished a series and the previous book, I think was seven years ago. And the first one was like 15 years ago. I mean, talking like a long time enough to forget just about everything about the series. So, so George R. R. Martin. No. Sorry? <laughs> I said, so George R. R. Martin. That's a bad yeah. joke. Yeah, no, pretty much similar. <laughs> um, and so being able to go back and listen to a voice clip of this character voice that you did is really, really helpful. So when I do that, uh, all I'm doing is gathering information. I'm not listening to the story. I'm not enjoying listening to my voice. All I'm doing is going, what was the voice? Great, got it, done. And I don't ever listen to my own books. So I know what you're talking about and I do have, um, I do have friends who narrate who go back and listen and have that feeling of, wow, I would do that differently. And without listening, I can tell you, yeah, I was, I was too young for such and such a book, or I was not in the right headspace for such and such a book and probably would do a better job, you know, at a different time. But um, I never, I never go back and, and listen. Um. I actually have been listening to a series that I did many, many years ago. Um, and you hear, I hear 
little tweaks that I would I would make. Um, but part of it is if you're telling the story, you still get swept up in the story. There are some character voices that I just nailed um, that tickle me <laughs> um, to hear. When I go back and listen to to get the character voice, what 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 really happens? It's it's more of a remembering the physicalization that created the voice in the first place. And so it's almost like I'm entering that body. And if that body was right, um, and you pretty much know within a page of the dialogue, because I have done this where I started off, encountered a character, made a choice, got through a page of dialogue and then went, no, this is wrong. This is not, this is not the character. There's something that's not organic here. I will go back and do it again and make some adjustment because the, the physicalization and that that's what I'm reminding myself of when I go back and listen to a voice. Oh, right. And some of that has to do with the picture I have in my head of who that character is. And if, if I remember that, it doesn't matter to a certain degree what comes out of here, because if I'm thinking it, you're going to hear it. I want to, I want to pick up on the original question again, because I think it's also important to understand the difference between um, critiquing and uh, experiencing. And so for me, I know that there are some people who will tell um, narrators who are up and coming, learning how to do it. They'll say like, listen to yourself. And I always feel like that's, that's a recipe for disaster because once you get in the habit of listening to yourself, then when you're speaking, you are recalling the experience of listening to yourself. And I think something that um, to serve the book well, you need to forget you're there and you need to be really unself-conscious. So you kind of have to do the exercises and learn the techniques and do all the nitty gritty grunt work. And then you have to throw that out the window, kind of forget that there's anything to do with technique. You just, you got it in you, right? You know how to breathe, you know how to interpret, you know how to do all this stuff. And then you forget about it and you dive into the book and you tell the story. Right. And, I, and I, I think there's a danger in listening to your own work because um, it, can, it can put a shield between you and the ability to just be in the book. Right. I mean, the, the, and we, I think I've said this uh, before in terms of when I prepare a book, the biggest thing that I'm trying to re, to prepare is how did I feel when I first read the book and how can I convey that to the person I am telling the story to, which is the audience. Um, that's what you're going for there. And, and that when you're doing that time stops because you're so in the moment, you're not, you like, as Kate said, you, you're not thinking about breathing or this, you you're doing it. Um, and ultimately you'll, you'll, if you go back and listen to, Oh, didn't, you know, what will feel wrong is ah, the, that line didn't work. Well, you put a breath in the wrong spot generally because you broke the tension or you did this. And then, and so when you look at it, why didn't it work? Oh, okay. So now when I, now when I go back and I do that line again, I'll know not to do that, but it's more that the character is not breaking up that thought. The character is not breaking up that idea. The character for them, for them, it's poof, um, not, and sometimes it is. And when you go this way, it's like, no, that's wrong. Um, so, to that degree, you need to be in the story. And 
that's the the goal is to be in the story both as a narrator and as a listener i mean you it's it's like how many movies have you watched where you feel like you saw the opening credits and and it's over oh my god two hours went by uh and i was so caught up it felt like 10 minutes same thing happens in the story you know that chapter you know you know quick quick go to the next chapter you know so do you have time for one last question? Do we have one more question for the audience? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. One one more question. Hi there. I'm never. And <laughs> Yeah. Um <laughs> I was just <laughs> I'm a new reader slash listener because that's the, the way I get through it. And I love you guys and I love your voices you do. Um, and I just had a question and it's how you two met because I just don't know much about you two. So I'd love to learn. How, we, how did we meet? Oh, we did a show. Like right. how does, how, how does anybody, we were in a show together. We right. did a show. Right. Took us five <laughs> years to start dating, but yeah, we, we were, in as you like it together, um, and then just stayed in touch for a while before we kind of figured out that maybe we might have something in common. Our circles kept overlapping. It was like all roads lead to Rome. It was like yeah. it doesn't matter what you do, this person's going to have a connection with Michael. You're going to end up with him again. So it was like five yeah. years of kind of circling around, going mm -hmm. bowling together with this theater group. Mm -hmm. And I moved and lived two doors away from him. And it was just like, yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, Kate, Michael, do you have any projects that you're working on that you'd uh, like to tell people about? A gajillion. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, um, there are a number of, uh, if you're familiar with Ken Liu's um, Grace of Kings, uh, series. The third book will be being released very shortly. It's about 40 hours uh, called The Veiled Throne. Um, it's it's a, a, a great book for our times. I, I just finished um, it's called The Blood of a Dragon. I, I cannot recommend this book more highly. Uh, it's a new new guy, Jack Adkins. It has, it'll be released in the next probably two to three weeks. Um, it is one of the most laugh out loud, engaging, fun, fun um, stories I think I've done. Um, we did a, a romance, a kind of a true to life historical romance um, called The Color of Rain by John Feast, which uh, will be, if it's not out shortly, it will be. Um, and then upcoming, I have a, a the a Baron Mandy, which is coming from Audio Sorceress. Um, it's kind of a thriller. And then we have another Daniel Green, the next uh, episode in that. And um, yeah, so bunch of stuff. But it, it, what's been really rewarding is I, there's, I can't remember a book that, you know, and um, then Jacob Cooper's Song of Night just, uh, I think on the 14th of September was released, which has been a long time coming. Um, it's been great to watch him grow as a writer. Um, and that again, is a book I had, I pulled out a character voice. There's a character there that, that I had not tried that voice in probably 15 years. And when I read it, it was like, oh, Oh, this is the perfect time because it's one of my uh, favorite things. Um, it's a cameo character, but he's very important to the story, and he's so much fun. And there's just all kinds of fun stuff in that in in Jacob's work. And it's really been great to see him grow as a writer. So, so uh, uh, I've been very busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, just finished another one of Sherry Thomas's Lady Sherlock books. Mm -hmm. Fantastic series. Love, I love her. I've met her actually 
and she's just a delightful, delightful woman. And I think she's a brilliant, brilliant writer. So I really enjoy doing that. And um, just finished um, Charles Stross's uh, The Merchant Trade series. The, the series has been chopped up into different, different numbers of books and renamed, but it's basically, if you look up Charles Stross, you'll see the sort of trade, the family trade, the merchant series. And then there's like compendiums that have different names. This one is called Invisible Sun and it is the final book in the series. Um, 20 years in the writing from the first book to the last. Um, and then upcoming, I'm doing a, a Mitchell Hogan book, which is called Raven Reawakening. And it's sort of, it overlaps, right. it with, overlaps the world with the series that you're doing, right? right? Right, it's the Necromancer series that I do with them. Um, I think we're, I've done the first four books in that series. I, I wonder, one other book that, that I think uh, that we both found really, really well written is, is uh, Soul Mirrors, mm -hmm. uh, which we did together. It's, uh, I, I, there are books where you really have, you want to be really careful because you feel like there's not a misplaced syllable in the writing. Um, and so you, you just, you have to get it right because it's just so, it's, so well done and um and that's been out i think for a couple months but it really it's it's a great read and a totally different it it it, it makes you think um but it's a good story a really good story and then upcoming i have um I'm so excited about this. It's like a Viking series. So you want to talk about like gruesome battles. <laughs> I'm going to be like knee deep in sheep and yeah. gore. It's going to be fantastic. Um, and I'm just trying to find the, okay, here it is. Lords of Aleka. Um, and I'm going to be doing the first one of those this fall into winter. And then the next one, it, so the first one is called Eye of the Wolf, and then the next one is called Mark of the Hunter. <clears throat> That's for Podium Publishing. Mm -hmm. And I just finished doing the second book in the Keeper Origin, Jins. Um, so that was Raven's Ruin. And um, that's, uh, you know, like, there. The, it's funny because so many stories, they're the same story, right? Like we're all humans, but we're absolutely, completely, totally unique and fascinating. Um, and especially when you get into the, all of the fantasy series, the, 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 the world building and the specific types of magic and the specific interactions with that is just fascinating. Um, so the Raven's Ruin follows uh, a, a, a young woman who is developing her power. And again, of course, it's metaphor, right? But that's another good series. Uh, so that's, that's what I have coming up. And um, there are more, yeah. but I don't have the list in front of me, so. Yeah. <laughs> and what's your website so that people can uh, track all the work that you do? So you can find us either kateredingaudiobooks.com or michaelkrameraudiobooks.com. Great. Thanks. Kate and Michael, you are always so generous with your time, um, and we so love having you at SpoilerCon. Thank you so much. I also want to tell you that the um, SpoilerCon listeners are also being very generous with their money. We are currently at $2,852 raised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
for those who are attending SpoilerCon, uh, you can find the information on how to participate in the silent auction and make direct donations in our Auction Links 2021 channel. If you are watching this after SpoilerCon is over, you can go directly to bookstoprisoners.net to make your donation. Uh, Kate and Michael, thank you so much again. Um, we're so generous. Let's have a round of applause.